Welcome to part 4 in the video series How to Use Linux Mint, a free and open source operating system. In this video we're going to look at the system settings and all of the nifty doodads you can do. So let's dive in. Free your mind. So by default, the system settings can be located in the app menu, and you can open it up by uh, selecting system settings right here in the favorites bar, or if you need to actually go through the categories, it's going to be in administration. No, it's going to be in preferences. I totally said that. Yeah, totally in preferences. Absolutely. So we go to preferences and then system settings and left click and that's going to open up the system settings window. Now this is a very simple, friendly, and easy to use settings manager that allows you to modify certain attributes of uh, both the front and the back end of Linux Mint, meaning you can affect the appearance as well as alter your preferences and uh, modify your online accounts uh, and make some small changes to the hardware configuration. So we're gonna go through some of the more useful components step by step and see exactly what we can do with these system settings here. Now, right off the bat, you see at the top there is a search bar. You can use this to search for a setting if you don't want to scroll down through this list. Now, it's not a huge extensive list at all, but if you still wanted to get something quicker, like say if you wanted to get to the sound settings, you can begin to type in sound and anything that pertains to the word sound will begin to show up and filter itself into the main window here. Backspace will uh, erase all of the entry and bring you back to showing all of the items. So the, the items are broken down into a few categories here. They're broken down into appearance and that's going to contain all of the uh, visual appearance elements here in Linux Mint. There's preferences which deal from a, a a couple of different things from the account settings uh, to the way that applets are handled to your desktop how it's handled um, hot corners if you have those enabled so you can move your mouse up to the corner of the screen to perform certain tasks um, startup applications window tiling and even workspaces so that's all in the preferences that's basically how to handle different preferences for each component not to mention online accounts as well, which is a big part of the uh, part of the conveniences of a GNOME-based desktop, which is exactly what Cinnamon is, is it's using many of the components made in the GNOME desktop for Linux, uh, and it polishes things up and adds different features, but there's a lot of core benefits from the GNOME desktop that are actually in here, and online accounts is typically one of them. Then scrolling down here, you have uh, hardware, which allows you to modify different attributes of the hardware settings. So if you wanted to configure a Bluetooth device, or if you have a Wacom or a graphics tablet, um, or change the functions of the mouse and touchpad, uh, you would do that over here. And, uh, you know, of course, printers, because we all still use printers today, even though it's it's uh, the year of our Lord 2019, and there's... Uh, plenty of digital things going around, we still use paper, hoorah. And the system info where you can see a bunch of uh, information, general uh, stats and specs uh, hardware-wise on your computer. And then at the bottom we have administration, which typically handles some of the more admin-related tasks for Linux Mint. So that would be things like uh, configuring the login window or uh, mainly working with the users and groups so you can add users or groups to your uh, computer so that new people can log in. Uh, your firewall settings, if you have that enabled, that way you can be more protected against all of the cruel and nasty viruses that, well, most of them aren't written for Linux-based operating systems anyway, so you usually don't have to worry about this, but at the same time, it is a better safe than sorry thing. And then the driver manager, which actually can be a very important tool because there are a lot of third-party drivers out there for hardware on your machine that don't always uh, come installed by default that you may need to search for and install in order to enjoy certain functionalities that uh, may not be available out of the box after you install Linux Mint. But that's the gist of it there. You can use the scroll bar on the right and left click in order to 
uh, move up and down in this area here in the main window. Um, or you can simply use the scroll wheel on your mouse and you can uh, scroll up and scroll down. It's all about what you prefer. So every time you click on an option, like let's say the, uh, the themes, uh, you can left click on it and it's going to open up the window. Uh, this, the main window is going to change to that new settings module. So now everything here is all about uh, the, the changing of the theme in your system settings. If I was to go back by clicking the back button here, it says go back to all settings. And then this will change dynamically depending on which setting I'm actually clicking on to edit or modify. So you can see this is now showing all of the system settings for the uh, date and time. And if I click back again, it's going to uh, go back to the main window here. So the same as with screensaver. And you'll start to see it the layout just changes to be, uh, to be for that particular setting. So a basic rundown of each of these, uh, the more important ones I'll, I'll get into. Uh, some of the ones that aren't as frequently used, I'm just going to let you explore and dive into the wild blue wondrous waters of the settings module. But the typical settings we'll take a look at here, like backgrounds. If you wanted to change your background, uh, this is pretty intuitive. It allows you to scroll down with your uh, scroll wheel or using the scroll bars and you can select uh, an image and just by left clicking it immediately makes it the uh, wallpaper in the background. As always, Mint comes with a nice variety of backgrounds for you to choose from. If you want to make modifications specifically to it, you can go into settings up here. These are tabs that allow you to change the window to work with that particular area. So if you wanted to zoom or you wanted to scale it, or you wanted to, hey, get creative and do a mosaic. So different ways that you can uh, modify the image in the background, even playing backgrounds as a slideshow. You can also add uh, your own custom wallpaper images from the pictures folder if you have it, or if you want to add a new folder, just click on that plus uh, button at the bottom and that's going to open the add folder window. I'm going to cover the rest of the appearance options over here in uh, video six, which is going to be how to customize Linux Mint. So we're gonna leave that one there for now, but moving on down, if you need any uh, accessibility features in Mint, such as high contrast or larger text, this is where you would go for that. Changing things to the high contrast makes it a little bit easier if that's your thing or that's what you need. You notice it changes the, uh, the desktop icons as well as the quick launch icons and a couple of other uh, layout design elements. And the same can be done if you need some kind of uh, keyboard assistance to enable like the on-screen keyboard. Uh, in this case on the computer, it came up at the, uh, at the top, but you can move that around to where you need it to go. So that's the accessibility. Um, if you wanna make changes to your account, such as change your picture, your username, or your password, it would be done in the account settings. So you can uh, make a modification to like chess. Chess is fun. Uh, to your profile picture, if you want to change the name to something and your password. Uh, the date and time options, it will by default go to network time and it does use tw the 24 hour clock by default. So those of us who use AM PM, have to disable uh, that feature right there. If you do want to change your time zone, you can click this unlock button and it, it is going to ask for your administrative password in order to do that. You can simply type that in and click authenticate or press the enter key. And then it allows you to um, make adjustments to the time zone. So going back, 
There are certain features on the desktop. This is primarily showing the icons that show up. So if you want more of a clean look or you want to remove some of the icons just to clean things up, you can toggle these off, uh, including any drives that you might have mounted. But again, that's purely your preference. This is all just based on uh, what you'd prefer to see on your desktop. Uh, the general preference allows, uh, this actually is kind of an important one because if you're using uh, high DPI screens or 4K screens, uh, anything above 1920 by 1080, uh, the standard uh, high definition dimensions, you're going to want to change this user interface scaling. Sometimes it is by default set to auto, but that doesn't always scale the interface up and can look really, really small uh, on some 4K screens. So to modify that, you would actually click this and in the drop down menu, select double high DPI. Now I'm not using a 4K screen. I'm actually using a, a standard high definition 1920 by 1080. So this wouldn't actually be of any use to me. In fact, clicking on it would make things super big. Hooray. Which that's not what we want. So to go back to auto, uh, it should return things to normal, which it does. Um, for those of you who are experiencing screen tearing, you can, uh, which is when you move the windows back and forth, you start to see like jagging, jagged distortions appearing in the windows. And it almost seems like it's like getting cut with an ax briefly. That's called screen tearing and that can be fixed by this option here. And it's a little bit of trial and error, but you can play around with these and whichever one seems to fix that screen tearing problem, uh, that can, that's your solution for that. And then some miscellaneous options to disable automatic screen rotation, enable timer and enable support for indicators. You know, being dead honest, I actually have no idea what this one's for. And if anyone does know, uh, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below because I have never used this and toggling things I've never used scares me. No, it's probably just, yeah, I wouldn't even imagine something would change, but I don't know what it does. There you go. Uh, the hot corners is a nifty little feature you can uh, select that and that is going to allow you to perform certain uh, interface benefits if you if you like this kind of thing. So enabling one of the hot corners will allow you to see certain things and what you see below in this drop down menu here is what you're going to see when you move your mouse up to this corner on the desktop. So in this case if I want to choose it to say show all windows and I open up a file browser and a terminal and I move my mouse all the way up here well now it's going to show all the windows so I can quickly move back and forth between them if I wanted and again this is more of a customization feature which we'll go into more in video 6 but that's a handy way of using the corners in your desktop to perform certain things that might make navigation a little bit easier The notifications, you can change a few things about the notifications and that's just when you get a new email or you get alerts on updates, they typically show in the bottom right here or the top right depending on uh, where, your, where your panel is. But you can make some small modifications to it here. And if you want to display a test, you just left click the display a test notification and that's where you'll see it appear. Now this is a pretty big one, online accounts because when you have certain programs installed that were typically made by a GNOME or a GNOME-based uh, application, if it's meant to sync with the GNOME shell, which is the GNOME desktop, you'll find that there are actually benefits to using this, uh, these online accounts. If you ever see the word GNOME appear like this um, in Linux Mint, that's because this entire desktop, this interface, was made and branched off of another desktop that was made uh, that's called the GNOME Shell. And so you're going to see at times uh, there's going to be a bit of overlap where this online accounts section was made for GNOME and uh, many of the programs that incorporate or, or are associated with it still 
recognize the uh, this component as GNOME, and that's one of the reasons it still stays on there. So if I clicked on, say, Google, and I wanted to add my Google account, um, I would enter the email and then the password, and then click on Next and allow it. And then you would begin to see a couple of options over here that you could modify like the calendar or your contacts. You can immediately have them in the contacts application. Um, and that's, that's super handy. So, and again, you're going to see it says continue to GNOME. And that's just because this was originally made for a different desktop. And it's kind of being tweaked or modded a little bit. Uh, in order to work with Linux Mint. It still is a fairly straightforward and smooth process, but I wanted to alleviate any confusion because, hey, that's why you're here. You're learning about these little tweaks in the, uh, uh, in the operating system. Like, hey, why is this called GNOME? Well, that's, that's why now. So whenever you think of GNOME, just think that there are components in here that are made for a different desktop uh, originally that are, have been, are being used or utilized by Linux Mint's Cinnamon desktop. Privacy is a big one nowadays because, hey, Big Brother's always watching. <laughs> so we're, uh, there are a few things here that can help with your privacy. Remembering recently accessed files. Uh, this will actually appear in your applications menu. So if you look down here, you see recent files and uh, places. And by disabling that, uh, it should, yep, it removes that recent files uh, item from this menu list and that's just a way if you don't want people who so maybe someone else uses this desktop or laptop and you don't want them to see the files that you're working with for whatever reason because hey it's privacy is more than fine it doesn't mean you're doing something shady it just means that you would like your privacy and you just want to work with your files and don't want other people to see them and that's more than okay uh, so that's a way to disable that and the last thing I want to cover in preferences is it kind of dabbles into the customization, but this is a really nifty feature that not a lot of people are aware of, uh, but is really, really beneficial when you learn to use it right. And it's something that you, s you recently saw that Windows might have adapted, but this concept a bit has been in Linux for a long, long time. And it's called workspaces or virtual workspaces. And what that is, is that allows you to have multiple desktops running at once and you can have windows in each one or applications in each one so that you can perform a different set of tasks for different purposes so for example like right now it's and it, it is enabled by default but if i was to say work on some personal stuff over here and i'm doing some terminal stuff and let's say I want to watch a movie, so I open up the media player. And so I've got some personal things going on, but then I, I want to uh, switch to it. I, want, I don't want to close all these, but I just want to mentally switch to my work tasks or work projects. Well, I'm going to press Control Alt Right, and it moves to another workspace. Now, what that did is this is still the desktop that you're familiar with, but it moved to a workspace on the right. So for example, if I was to show you the workspace switcher over here, and I got there by hitting uh, on the keyboard Control and then Alt and then the up arrow key, you start to see the different workspaces that you can work in. So like all of the windows that I had in that first workspace are still there. Uh, but I'm able to quickly switch in between them and switch in between those workspaces. So let's say if I go back to workspace two, and let's say I want to do some web browsing and I want to do some work stuff, maybe do some homework, and I open LibreOffice Writer to do some text edit editing. And so I got kind of my business stuff, my work stuff over here. Uh, and then if I want to switch back to my personal, say I work for this for a while, or I just want to do something on this side, then I can come over here, left click, and it goes back to that workspace. So that's a nifty feature about the desktop that uh, a lot of people don't realize, um, but it's super, super handy. And it's uh, 
a great way to just organize things on different workspaces so that you can imagine them like they're different desks on uh, in a room so that you have one desk over here for this purpose you have another desk over here for whatever purpose and it's just a way to better organize the open applications that you have working on so you can kind of compartmentalize the way you use your computer when you need to uh, and so there are a couple of things and you can enable workspace osd which is the on-screen display so when you see the window switching you'll briefly see it'll say workspace 2 or workspace 1 and that just lets you know which one you switch to when you use the control alt and then the left and right arrow keys uh, if you want to disable that you can just toggle that and then you won't see them anymore when you switch going into settings just gives you a couple of small uh, adjustments to that you can cycle through workspaces which means that when you get to the end which they typically have four then pressing Control alt right again brings you back to workspace one. It cycles it around. Uh, and then a couple of other features here. Okay, so hardware. This is all going to feel pretty familiar because a lot of these same settings modules are something that you would see in the Windows System Settings Manager or the uh, Mac OS system settings manager. So thankfully we've got that going for us where that's less of a learning curve that we have to take in order to learn something about Linux Mint. So in this case I don't have any Bluetooth adapters on here but this would be where you could locate Bluetooth devices you know do the same things you'd see like on your uh, Android or iPhone uh, in order to connect to Bluetooth. Um, same as with the graphics tablet this one doesn't have a tablet uh, but you can connect through Bluetooth or USB, and that allows you to do any kind of artwork in Linux Mint using one of the, the drawing tablets. Uh, mouse and touchpad. And there's actually quite a few features in here, just because there's a lot of different ways people use their mice and their touchpads. Some of them like the reverse scrolling direction. Um, others like to adjust the pointer size and speed uh, so that they can have the larger pointers or if they want. And then the touchpads are the same way. Some people like the tap to click feature on their laptops, and those are uh, enabled by default. Um, and especially this can be a big one that can be irritating for some people, is to disable the touchpad while typing. So some people, especially with laptops, when the keyboard is being used, it disables the touchpad. And this is in case you accidentally are having your palm on the touchpad while you're typing. And that way you won't risk typing something which can be helpful but really annoying especially if people are looking to uh, play games or they want to use the touchpad and the keyboard simultaneously then in that case you just want to toggle that uh, off so those are really helpful tools for using your mouse and then your keyboard as well you know the keyboard has a few few options on there as far as uh, typing and then the shortcuts for those of you who are really into the keyboard, you can start to see if you really want to dig into here and figure out which, uh, which keyboard shortcuts actually do which tasks. So in this case, if I wanted to show the desktop, the keyboard bindings are what, which keys I would press in order to perform that action. In this case, it's the super key plus the D key. And the super key is the window key. So if I hold down super and plus D, it's going to show the desktop. It's going to minimize all the windows. And the same as with any other of these uh, menu, these keyboard options right over here. Um, network, of course, is always a big one because everybody loves connecting to the internet and using the World Wide Web. What on earth would we use these computers for without it? Well, this will show you on your left your all of your network interfaces. Uh, your wired, your wireless, um, any others that are currently connected or active. And then on the right, uh, depending on what you select, it's going to give you all of the information for those connections. So in the event that you need to disable one wired connection or a wireless for whatever reason, this is where you would go to typically do that. So with printers, Linux Mint is fantastic about automatically finding uh, most printers that you have and setting them up to where you can at least print. 
Um, again, this is a basic installation and I don't have any hardware connected to this one, so there are no printers on it. But man, it is super handy, especially if your printer is connected through the network. Um, it will find and set things up. You may not be able to scan. You might have to install additional software for that. But as far as printing, you usually out of the box have a, a printer set up and good to go if you have one on and on your network. It's a great, great feature. Uh, makes things really easy, especially for first timers. So the sound menu, we kind of covered in video one, but this allows you to modify the volume of the of the sound and also say which output device you'd like to select. The volume will actually change dependent on which output device you select. And then the same is with the input. Uh, if you want to, if you have a microphone that you want to use and you want to select a certain microphone, say for recording, you can select that and then uh, modify the input volume. Sounds, if you like the startup sounds or the uh, general action sounds that Linux Mint comes with, then you can uh, keep them here. If you don't like them, you like if you don't want to hear a startup sound whenever you start the uh, Cinnamon desktop, which is the process after you log in, you just toggle that off and then you don't have the sound to worry about. The same is with changing the volume or removing a USB flash drive or inserting one. They have a couple of sounds by default. And you know, for the people who like sounds, there, there you go. And then the rest of these are more application centric if you uh, want to tweak the settings for any applications that, that are currently using your sound. You can do that here. As you can see right now, I don't have any. And then finally, you have amplification, which if you want to have the maximum volume above 100%, you can modify that here in order to amplify any of the sound that's coming out to your speakers. So if you, you need that extra oomph, you know, if you need that setting to go up to 11, as they would say it's on Spinal Tap, then this would be the setting for you. And then lastly, System Info just gives you a basic rundown of the version of Linux Mint that you have installed, which is the operating system, the Cinnamon Desktop, and the version of that because that is the desktop we're using. Linux Mint does come in a couple of different desktops for different purposes. This is their most common and most popular version uh, and that's why you see it say Cinnamon here. You can see which version of the Linux kernel you're running which is important depending on what kind of hardware you buy. In this day and age the kernel is everything as far as your ability to talk to hardware and the hardware drivers that might come installed with it or ones you might have to install yourself. So usually the higher number the better uh, because that means greater compatibility with newer hardware. It also tells you which processor you have, if you need to know that stuff, your memory, your hard drive, uh, what kind of graphics card. And if you're feeling generous and not worried about personal information, which there's no personal information that gets included as you see in this little tooltip area here, you can left click to upload the system information and that what that does is that sends this information to the Linux Mint developers this here so that they kind of know what you're working with. Oh, there it is. Yep, it's all there. My whole life story. <laughs> We're going to close that. Um, just so it tells the developers what you're working with. Uh, so that they know how to better tailor the software and better tailor the operating system for future needs for users. So very generous of them. We love you guys. We appreciate that. And then finally, the administration section. So as I said, there's a few key important things here. I'm just going to go over a few of them. Uh, users and groups is a big one, and it's big enough that you do have to enter your administrative password in order to access it. And that's because this is a big part of uh, one of the benefits of Linux initially, the multi-user login capability, even long before there was a desktop, um, was a very handy feature in, uh, in Linux that was uh, not something, especially when it was a like command line based, that was a big helpful feature. So they've given a graphical user interface to that. You can tell this is the primary user that I have. Uh, and this tells you what type the account is, the name, the password. And then if I wanted to add someone, I'd simply click the add, add button below. Uh, typically, you can make them a standard user or an, an administrator. Uh, and let's say if I just called it user2, uh, which is the 
sorry, that's the actual name, so why don't we do that? User2, and then their username is user2. And then I can click the add button at the bottom. And hey, we've got user2 now. And user2, they like coffee, so uh, user2 gets coffee. And then you can add their password from there. Or if they log in, they can, after you log out, then they can modify their password as well. Groups gets a little technical because uh, each user is assigned to specific groups. Not gonna lie, I don't personally use this too much and I know that there are a lot of benefits to this. This is something that I, as an end user, don't really use, if at all. So if any, again, if anyone has any comments on the benefits of groups and how that can help the user, by all means, help me out here and throw a, throw a comment uh, down there in the comment section. And then I'm going from right to left here, uh, but the software sources, again, is a very important thing, so that's why you have to put in your uh, administrative password. And this lets you uh, choose where you're going to get software from. And that's a, a big part because this is mainly your access to all of the free software that Linux has to offer. In this case, the main packages comes from this server here, packages.linuxmint.com. And then many of the base packages, because Linux Mint is an operating system that is based off of another Linux-based operating system called Ubuntu. And uh, Ubuntu is distributed worldwide, much like Linux Mint. And many of the software components, the software packages that you see, are actually stored on Ubuntu's uh, servers. So that's why they say this is the base archive here, and that's where a lot of the, the programs that you get come from. And then uh, Linux Mint has their own package repository, which is their stash of personal packages and applications. PPAs are something that I'll probably make a separate video for, but in short, it's personal package archives. It's for third-party developers who aren't uh, a part of the Linux Mint team or the Ubuntu team, and they want to make software and they wanted to make it easy for users to access, to get, and uh, to stay up to date with. They've created PPAs, which are personal package archives that you can use uh, to easily distribute your software. Now, you kind of got to be careful with this. Uh, you got to know what you're doing. Otherwise, you could run some potential security risks. Uh, it's very minor. It's a very minor concern, so it's nothing really to be hugely worried about. But at the same time, I'm a better safe than sorry kind of guy. So that's my, uh, my take on that. And then the, the uh, last part I'm going to go into is the driver manager. Now this is an important one, and again so important that you have to put in your administrative password. So it's going to immediately begin updating the uh, all the repository data and make sure that it has the latest package records to work with. So that way you're not working with outdated packages. And it will show you in this driver manager window any hardware that you have that typically requires a non-free software driver, uh, meaning that a proprietary driver is one where the software is made, but it is not open source. It's called closed source. And so they don't release the source code to the public. Um, that final piece of code is something that you can't edit or change. And so the reason that they have this here is the there are hardware manufacturers like uh, NVIDIA is a big graphics card hardware manufacturer and they make graphics cards, but for Linux, they don't offer an open source uh, driver, not fully. And so in order to uh, get all of the beautiful benefits of a powerful graphics card, you're going to see it appear in this window here and you're going to have to select one of these radial menu options uh, in order to install and use the third-party driver. And that's what's going to enable that hardware device on your machine and allow you the benefits, the sweet nectar of performance power that can come from those uh, devices. 
So that's a basic rundown of these system settings, and that concludes part four of this video series. Really appreciate you watching. Would love if you could do me a favor and hit the like button below if you found this video helpful or useful. Um, and feel free to subscribe if you want to see more videos from Free Your Mind. But other than that, feel free to uh, move on to the next video, and we will see you there.